All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Crimson Education's first ever live stream on YouTube. I'm so excited for this. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Sam Clark. I'm the lead video producer for Crimson Education. Uh, what that means is that for about the last five years, I've filmed all of the videos that you see here on the YouTube channel. So we've traveled to 50 universities all around the world, interviewed four, over 400 impressive students, talking to them about their experience applying to university, their experience at their dream university, and so much more. Um, in addition to that, I'm also an alum of Harvard University. I graduated uh, in 2015, um, Phi Beta Kappa and Magna Cum Laude with an honors degree in social studies, which was Harvard's sort of build your own social science degree. Um, and I'm really excited to be kicking off our first ever live stream to basically answer questions that you may have about the admissions process, about our own filming process when we're going to universities all around the world, and about the um, experience of both Crimson students and any other students all around the world once they get to their dream universities. Um, if you are tuning in now live, you of course can an uh, ask questions in the comments and I'll try to get to them. We also have um, over 20 questions that have been submitted to us uh, via Instagram DM, Instagram comments, TikTok, um, YouTube comments, and more. So I'm so excited to get started. If you have a question, drop it in the chat. Uh, but first of all, I'm just going to start with the list of questions that have already been submitted to us. Um, the first question that we got, which I'm very excited to start with, um, it's a big one, is what is your advice for writing your Common App personal essay? Um, this is a big one, right? Uh, the Common App personal essay is, I think, one of the most daunting parts of the college application process, right? Because you're a senior in high school and you're trying to sort of encapsulate everything about you in and your character and your growth um, in a short essay and not that long of an essay, about 500 words. Um, and I feel very fortunate at Crimson because um, I've had the fortune to uh, speak and teach a number of webinars about um, specifically the use of storytelling in your college application. So I'm going to start with that when it comes to your Common App personal essay. Um, the Common App personal essay is is kind of in many ways the um, the core of your application, right? It's it's asking you to talk about um, an aspect of your identity or background that means something to you, to talk about a failure or achievement that has made you who you are and so much more. Um, so at Crimson, when we work with our students, a lot of what we talk about is the fact that um, your Common App personal essay is fundamentally very, very different than an academic essay that uh, that you would be submitting in an English class or a history class. It's um, rather than an essay, you want to think of it as a story. So what at the core of a what what makes a story compelling? A story like uh, like you would read um, in a novel, you would watch in a TV show, you would watch in a movie. What makes a story compelling? And ultimately, what really makes a story compelling is that you have a protagonist at the core of your story, and that protagonist is. Uh, uh, overcomes obstacles in order to achieve a goal. And in the course of overcoming those obstacles, they evolve and they change who, they're, who they are. That I would argue, and many Crimson experts would argue, is what is at the core of a compelling story. So when you're thinking about your personal essay, you are positing yourself, a high school senior, as the protagonist in your own story. And you're thinking about communicating to admissions officers how some story related to you overcoming challenges made you who you are and caused you to evolve and change to become who you are. Um, so what does that mean like a, a little bit more uh, uh, practically, I guess is a great question. And, and there's a reason why we teach, you know, one hour long webinars about this concept specifically. Um, a lot of what that means is that first, when you're choosing a topic for your Common App personal essay, you don't necessarily want to choose an accomplishment, right? Writing about um, the day that you won um, a debate tournament or the day that you won a basketball game, like that's exciting, I suppose, but we can see those accomplishments in your activities list, in your resume, in your CV. There are plenty of other places in your application where we can see accomplishments. So talk about a, a moment that you struggled, a time that you struggled, and what's more important than the struggle or than the, the actual subject matter of the story is think about how did that change who you are 
and change either your outlook on life, change um, how much you strive to be braver, how you strive to be more compassionate, how you strive to be more spontaneous. Um, so some examples of that, um, one of my favorite uh, essays that we talk about a lot in Crimson uh, webinars when it comes to this personal essay is um, uh, there was a student who wrote his application, his personal essay about the fact that he ran for student council several years in a row, never got it. The final time that he decided, you know what, I'm gonna run for student council, I'm going to do it my own way. Um, and he gave his speech at the school assembly to the entire school with a sock puppet. Um, and he talked about that in the course of doing that, what he realized was that um, he something that he likes more than, say, student government is making people laugh and is approaching um, storytelling and entertainment in different ways, which has led him to want to be a writer and an actor. So he took an experience that may, that's certainly not an accomplishment. He lost to the student council election. He thinks that he really embarrassed himself in front of a lot of friends, in front of a lot of uh, classmates, but he turned it around to talk about a way that he himself had grown. Um, and actually that's that segues into um, a question that we're getting right now from Emily saying, what is the most unusual thing someone has written about for the personal essay? Is it worth it to take some risks? To answer the second question first, absolutely worth it to take some risks. Because here's the thing, an admissions officer is looking at hundreds of applications every day. You need to grab them right at the top. So take some risks, right? Um, take some risks. Talk about a time when you embarrassed yourself. Talk about an aspect of your identity that maybe you've been grappling with for a long time or an aspect of family tradition um, that you've been grappling with for a long time. In terms of the most unusual thing um, someone has written about, um, we had a, a student who decided to write about, oh, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to get the exact nursery rhyme right, but um, Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. How many pickled peppers did Peter Piper pick? I actually did get it right. Um, we had a student who wrote about the fact that from a young age, the way that his mind analytically works is he, he needs to kind of, he has an urge to, to break down um, common phrases and, um, and, uh, uh, sort of, yeah, nursery rhymes like that. Um, so he used his personal essay to talk about when he was young, hearing that for the first time and, and grappling with it and his entire thought process of figuring out mathematically exactly how many, uh, uh, oh man, I'm getting my, uh, I'm getting all, all tongue tied on it, but he did essentially a written out mathematical proof answering that nursery rhyme and talked about that's how he views the world and he intends to view the world um, through a lens of problem solving. Um, another good example, and this actually goes to um, a question that we got um, submitted via YouTube comments was the question of what did I, Sam Clark, uh, write my common app personal essay about? Um, so I'll tell you. I wrote my common app personal essay about the fact that when I was in the first grade, um, my teacher sent a report home with me that I had to give to my parents saying that, um, you know, Sam Clark is at times a joy to have in class, but at other times he needs to resist the urge to roll around on the floor with his friends. That was essentially the opening quote of my common app personal essay. Um, and I used that initially to talk about the fact that when I was growing up, I had a lot of unbridled energy. Um, I had a lot of attention starting from place to place, and I, I didn't know what to do with it, right? I, I didn't know how to funnel it. It got me in trouble a lot. It got me to the principal's office nearly every week for most of the first grade. Um, but what I talked about, uh, again, going back to the, the very beginning of this live stream where I said that the core of a compelling story, and your common app is a story, is talking about the protagonist. How do they overcome an obstacle? How do they grow as a result of it? So what I talked about was the fact that that sort of unbridled energy that got me in trouble a lot in elementary school is the same energy that I learned how to harness when I grew older through the avenues of theater. Might not shock you to learn that I was a drama club kid. Um, and through Taekwondo, I started martial arts. And what I learned through those mediums was a way to take the energy that had gotten me in trouble before and use it in a way that was productive in a way that, um, not only helped myself feel fulfilled, but helped other people, especially because starting later in high school, I started to teach Taekwondo. And I started to learn that, you know, maybe this type of unbridled energy in kids that gets them in trouble and sent to the principal's office 
um, uh, can actually be encouraged and uh, urged forward in a um, productive and fulfilling way. Um, and that was the approach that I took to teaching kids in Taekwondo and talking about my own evolution. I, I talked about how I wanted to move forward working in education in various spaces so that um, kids like myself growing up wouldn't, uh, wouldn't feel reprimanded for, for having enthusiasm. So that's another good example of common app personal essays. Coming back to the um, initial question, right, about uh, advice for that common app personal essay, kind of bringing it all together here. Think of it as a story. Posit yourself as the protagonist in the story and think about what is a moment that caused you to change, to evolve for the better, and how do you see yourself going forward after that? Um, if you're a funny person, use your humor. If you're an analytical person, use those instincts for analysis. Um, and try not to approach it as an academic essay. It's not a five paragraph essay about William Faulkner or about the causes of World War II, right? It's a story about you and you're telling the admissions officer something that they can't find anywhere else in their application. Don't list your accomplishments. We see that in the activities list. Um, yeah, tell a story about yourself, something that you've overcome and how you've changed as a result. Um, so that's one popular question that we've gotten is uh, regarding the Common App personal essay. I'm going to go back to my list of what um, what has been submitted to us. Ooh, another good question about the Common App is how should I approach supplemental essays? Supplemental essays are very tough. I remember when I was applying to college, I wrote my Common App personal essay and I was like, ooh, yeah, I got it. Um, I'm ready to apply to all my dream schools. And then you look at the list of supplemental essays and you realize every single school has them. Some schools like Stanford, U Chicago have weird ones. Some of them like Tufts have like seven or eight of them. So it's a lot to take on. Um, so a few thoughts on that. First of all, with supplemental essays, a core principle that Crimson always abides by is uh, an admissions officer should never look at a supplemental essay um, and think that you copied and pasted it and changed a few words from another school, right? One of the foundational uh, supplemental essays that nearly every single school has is what we at Crimson call the why this school essay. Why do you want to apply to Stanford? Why do you want to apply to Dartmouth? What makes you think that you would be a good part of the community at MIT, UCLA, USC, Harvard, right? Um, and it's easy to, you know, look it up <laughs> on the Harvard or MIT website, talk about, um, the location, talk about, uh, you know, the city. Oh, I want to go to Columbia because it's in the middle of New York City. I love New York City. Um, think about it. Admissions officers, again, are reading thousands of these. They see that type of essay every time. So the way that you want to approach it is to really think about a supplemental essay as even though you're answering the question, why do you want to go to the school? It's still an essay about you. So think of it through the lens of the academic discipline that you want to pursue, your extracurricular passions, and what you want to do in the future. For those three things, think about how a certain school can be a good match for each of those. Let's say you're applying to Dartmouth. Let's say you want to do philosophy. Don't just do research on Dartmouth in general. Don't just talk about you know its location in New Hampshire, the beautiful foliage, it being a top Ivy League, its school ranking, that kind of thing. We all know that, right? But think about, all right, I want to study philosophy. Let me look up the details of the Dartmouth philosophy department. Let me look up some of the research that some of those professors have done, some of the classes that they teach, and talk about how you think you would be a good match because you want to work with these professors in particular. Let's say you're applying to Harvard. You have interests in community service. Talk about, there's an organization at Harvard called the Phillips Brooks House Association. It's the umbrella organization for community service at the university. Talk about different ways that you would want to get involved and carve out your own niche in that community to pursue community service in the Cambridge, Boston area. Um, and honestly, you can kind of use that to talk about certain accomplishments of your own. Let's say you do a lot of research in high school um, in the field of, uh, let's say, statistics, right? You, you've done some summer programs. You've uh, uh, you've done some research papers in the area of statistics. Talk about your own research and how working at a school with a particular professor or with a particular department would be a continuation of that type of work, that type of rigor that you're pursuing. So that's kind of the category of the supplemental essay, the why this school essay. Um, our advice there, again, do research, 
that's not only specific to the school, but specific to what you want to pursue. Use it as an excuse to brag a little bit, to talk about your own accomplishments and how studying at the university in question would be a logical continuation of expansion of um, and kind of ultimate manifestation of the work that you want to do. Um, don't copy and paste, right? Uh, that's kind of the advice, right, for the why this school essay. The other essays, um, there's a lot of weird essays out there, honestly. Stanford famously has ones where you have to write a letter to your future roommate. UChicago famously um, changes theirs every year and has questions such as, where's Waldo? Um, again, the advice is similar here, both to the Common App personal statement and to the supplemental why the school essay, in that you're using this essay to show your personality, right? To show how you think about the world, to show how your outlook has changed over your years of education and life experience and how you hope to kind of continue that trajectory. So again, don't think of it as an academic essay. Think of it as a story about yourself. You are the protagonist um, and explore, you know? Now, all of this is very, very broad strokes, um, of course. Uh, and I, this is a perfect opportunity, honestly, for me to say that I've, I've gleaned a lot of this from my experience, again, filming with hundreds of students at 50 universities and with working with some of Crimson's strategists and academic advisors, but I'm the video producer, right? <laughs> I am not the strategist who is working with Crimson students every day to get them into their dream universities at seven times the rate of other students. So... If you have more questions about the Common App, about the personal essay, about the supplemental essays, about all of the nitty gritty little details, um, fully extend the uh, description below and you'll find a link to a free consultation with one of Crimson's academic advisors. Now, what that means is that you will meet with an academic advisor for a half hour to an hour um, completely for free and they will talk about your academic profile. They will talk about uh, the schools that you want to get into, the schools that you dream of getting into, the schools that you realistically can get into, and your strategy, be it six months from now, or if you're reaching out to them earlier, four years from now, um, for how to get in. In fact, if you check out our most recent video, which is a day in the life of a Duke student, his name was Wayne. He was a Crimson student from the UK. Um, he talks specifically in that video about his experience doing that consultation with one of Crimson's academic advisors, how it um, kind of gave him the confidence to realize he could get into a school like Duke and gave him the confidence to realize what his work with Crimson would look like. So that's all to say, click the link below to sign up for a free consultation with one of Crimson's academic advisors who can talk to you about the supplemental essays, the personal essays, and so much more in much greater depth and with much greater expertise than myself. That having been said, let's check out some of the other questions that we've gotten via Instagram DM. Let me consult my list. We talked about the Common App personal essay. We talked about the supplemental essays. The third question um, that we've gotten, we got a few different versions of this, so I'll kind of address a couple of them. One was, um, how do I know which extracurriculars to do in high school to get into my dream college? Another question that we got is, how should I write my activities list on the Common App? Let's go with the first question first about the extracurriculars that you're actually doing. The question, how do I know which ones to choose to maximize the possibility of getting into my dream university? My first reaction to this, quite frankly, is do what you love doing, right? At the end of the day, whether it's for its own intrinsic purpose or for the purpose of getting into a particular dream college or a particular set of dream universities, um, do what you're passionate about. Do what you love. It's going to be much more impactful, ultimately, in your application to write about your experience doing debate, which you love so much, than doing, let's say, National Honor Society because you feel like you should do National Honor Society in order to get into Dartmouth, in order to get into Cornell. Um, that's the initial basis is think about what you're passionate about. What, what wakes you up in the morning? What do you want to be working on every night after your homework until 2 AM? What fuels you? What drives you? What makes you passionate? Because ultimately, A, you're going to have to demonstrate some accomplishments within those extracurriculars and B, you're gonna have to write about those extracurriculars. You're going to have to write about how you spend your time outside of the classroom. And these admissions officers are, are going to look for passion. They're going to look for impact. So that's my first thought in terms of extracurriculars is do what you love. The second is, um, and this comes to the Crimson Education overall approach to extracurriculars, right? Oftentimes there are, we have students who have a, a disparate interests, right? You know, you'll, you'll have a student 
um, who is interested. This is a particular example, a student who ended up getting into Middlebury College while working with our strategists. Um, you'll have a student who's really interested um, in physics academically, but also outside of the classroom. Um, he really likes uh, writing poetry, right? Think about uh, how you can combine disparate activities into bigger, more ambitious projects. At Crimson Education, we call those projects capstone projects, right? Which means that as uh, strategists and extracurricular mentors at Crimson Education are working with students, they're talking with them about how they can combine their interests into something that has a big impact. Um, an example of this, we had a student, uh, her name was um, Tess Vara. She got into, um, she worked with uh, Crimson Education. She ultimately got into Stanford. That's where she's gonna go in the fall, very exciting. Um, her capstone project from earlier, in kind of the early days of the COVID-19 um, pandemic, she was realizing A, that she had an interest in art, B, that she had an interest in entrepreneurship, and C, quite frankly, and she's talked about this very frankly in a lot of her application, that um, she and her family um, were struggling financially. They were struggling monetarily. They needed to get more income in the door. Um, and part, so part of what she did, combining her love of painting with her love of entrepreneurship with simply the need to raise money, is she started hand painting Nike Air Force Ones and selling them um, via specialty order. She set up a business. And so she combined art with entrepreneurship, with a need to make money into essentially her own venture that she pursued and could write about in a passionate and exciting way. So in terms of overall um, extracurriculars, choose things that you're passionate about, but then ultimately as you're getting further into your high school career, as you yourself are developing into more of a, a person who knows who what your interests are, who knows what you want to pursue, think about like, okay, how can I com combine a couple interests? The student I mentioned before who got into Middlebury talk, uh, uh, was very interested in poetry, was also very interested in giving back to his community. He ended up combining those by um, hosting and putting together poetry writing workshops um, in retirement communities and nursing homes. That was his capstone project that a lot of, that his Crimson mentors kind of helped him build, but he was able to combine passions in a way that then showed impact. And showing impact is what brings me to the second question that we got related to common app, uh, to the, uh, pardon me, to extracurriculars, which was, okay, first question is, what extracurriculars should I do, right? Um, second question was, how do I write about them? The activities list on the common app is, um, it's deceptively hard, right? Because it's very short. You only get 10 activities. You only get 150 characters per activity, not words, but characters. How do you describe them in such a tight way? How do you order them one through 10? Um, the first piece of advice that uh, Crimson Strategist gives to their students is that you need to focus on impact first. What does that mean? That means that if I'm talking about the fact that I was in my in debate club or in the drama club, um, I don't want to just talk about my participation within those. You know, I was president of the debate club. That takes up a few words, right? We kind of know what that means. We don't need to describe what it means to be president of the debate club. Instead, what you want to describe in those limited characters is what is the impact that you specifically had within that activity? You know, we know what it means to be on the basketball team, but how did you as a team captain or even as a team player, how did you change the dynamics within your team? How did you change the way that things were operating? Um, this is true whether you create your own startup or nonprofit or whether you're a member of an existing institution is you need to talk about within those limited 150 characters, what is the impact with a capital I that you had within that activity? It's a precious small amount of characters. So the more that you can talk about the way that you tried to change things around you, the way that you tried to better the community or the institution that you were a part of or that you created, the more that admissions officers are going to see how you're going to change and flourish within and supplement the community of their university. So focus on impact um, is the first piece of advice that we give when it comes to writing the actual activities list. Um, the second is order them. You know, there's the big question of order. You know, I, I've done 10 activities. How do I order them? Um, put them on the order of the uh, that you're most passionate about. What do you spend the most time on? Do you spend the most um, Do you spend the most time on Club A or Club B? If it's Club B, it lists that higher. Talk about the impact, and we'll see it reflected throughout um, the rest of your application.
Um, so that was uh, my rambling both about extracurriculars and how to portray extracurriculars. Um, again, we teach entire hour-long webinars about just this topic. Um, and we have extracurricular mentors at Crimson Education who are dedicated specifically to this very, very sort of complicated and, and question-filled area of the college application and of your four years of high school. Um, so again, I implore you to click the link in the description below if you want to talk to one of those extracurricular mentors in particular. Um, now, before I get to my pardon me, my pre-written list of uh, questions that we got from Instagram and other platforms. We have uh, a question, another question here from Emily saying, what advice do you have for rising seniors to do in their final summer before application season? That's a great question. Um, so you're about, you're a rising senior, you're applying to college in the fall. It's scary. <laughs> it's a little terrifying. Um, two, two avenues here, I think. Um, one is let's think about like the actual meat and potatoes of what you need to put together for the application itself. Um, particularly if you're applying to very competitive colleges and if you're, you know, I, if you're subscribed to this channel, you're probably someone who's, who's pretty ambitious, right? Um, probably during the school year, you've got limited time in addition to all of the essays, problem sets, tests, uh, et cetera, that you're doing in your co coursework, you probably have limited time to write all of these application essays. There was the personal essay, there was the supplemental essays. If you're applying to scholarships, there's essays for those. Um, so use the time over the summer to write. Um, a lot of what I described at the beginning of this live stream talking about thinking about your common app personal essay as a story, positing yourself as the protagonist within the story who grows and evolves to become a different person. Um, that takes a lot of time, not just to write, but to think about, to ideate upon. Um, so use the time over the summer, if you have more time, um, to really work on those essays, to anticipate the fact that you're going to need to outline a lot of essays, you're going to need to scrap a lot of essays, you're going to need to write a lot of different drafts of those essays. Um, so use that time over the summer to work on the application itself. That way, once you head into the fall, um, you're kind of ready to go, right? That's, um, I, I felt quite proud of myself as a high school senior that by the time I started those, or by, pardon me, by the time that I started my fall semester of my senior year, um, my application essays were pretty much written. They needed revisions, they needed rewrites, but they were ready to go. So that's, that's point number one. The second point, um, Kind of relates back to extracurriculars, right? You know, there's a lot more emphasis every single year, especially at top competitive universities on what you're doing outside of the classroom. As I said before, what impact you're having on the communities and the institutions that you work with outside of the classroom. Um, so a big thing to do in that final summer is to is is to see like what 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 bigger impact can you have within uh, a certain activity, right? Um, a lot of students and, and uh, Crimson Education helps with these types of applications. A lot of students in the summer before their senior year um, are applying to various internships, research assistantships, um, uh, and various, you know, uh, academic discipline related um, camps for that, uh, for that summer before senior year. That's a great thing to do. If you can get into a competitive uh, robotics camp or coding camp, if you can, um, if you can, uh, uh, pursue, let's say you're interested in theater, if you can pursue some community theater productions that year that can sort of put you above where we're, where you were the previous year, um, apply to those, um, try to get into those. Um, the final thing though, I would say is, you know, like not, not everyone necessarily has the opportunity to do an expensive internship or assistantship. Maybe you need to work a summer job. Um, maybe you need to, um, support your family or, or your siblings in certain ways. Um, all of those things are completely valid because here's the thing, when it comes to the storytelling aspect of your Common App, you can talk about those experiences, right? The summer before my senior year, um, I was working a couple different jobs. I was uh, working as an assistant director and assistant stage manager at the local theater at, my, at the Denver Jewish Community Center. I was also teaching um, at the Taekwondo school that I had um, learned at before, right? Um, those things are valid, We're, you know, put in the work there Try to think again, similar to just a, a club, think within your summer job, what impact can you have within it? And then you can talk about that. Um, a great a great example that we bring up a lot, in fact, is that um, the CEO and co-founder of Crimson Education, Jamie Beaton, who got into um, a staggering number of top universities um, and had a lot of incredible achievements leading up to that, what he wrote about for his Common App personal statement 
was a summer job that he had at a fast food restaurant, right? He, he talked about what he learned from that. He talked about preconceptions that he had going into that. He talked about um, the impact that that had on his worldview, on his opinions on entrepreneurship. He obviously became a very successful entrepreneur co-founding this very company, right? Um, whatever it is that you're doing, you can write about it in a compelling way if you think about it through the lens of storytelling, through the lens of portraying your own growth and the way that you can fit within a community, whether that community is the ice cream shop that you work at, whether that community is Yale University, which you're applying to. Um, you can use any of these experiences um, to talk about your own character um, and how you would fit in at a university. Um, so really great question there um, from Emily. And with that, I'm going to go back to my questions list. Um, I'm gonna need one more, um, one more question. We got a lot of questions about um, admissions, about the Common App. We got a lot, a lot of questions about um, how we film, like what my experience has been filming at these dozens of universities. I'm gonna do one more question related to the Common App, related to applications before getting into the rest of that. And this question I think is a really good one, um, which is advice for getting letters of recommendation. Um, now, letters of recommendation within your college application are easy to forget about and discount, right? Because for the personal essay, you're writing a 500-word essay. For the supplemental essays, you're writing who knows how many essays, depending on how many colleges you're applying to and which colleges those are. Sometimes literally dozens of essays. For the SAT, you're preparing, you're studying, you're taking practice tests. Same thing for the ACT. Um, for extracurriculars, you're you're participating in your extracurricular, you're at your job, you're at your internship, you're at your after school club. Um, the letters of recommendation can be easy to forget because you're not writing the letter, right? Your teacher is. Um, but we do have a number of pieces of advice for how to get the most out of those applications. Um, the, the first one, and honestly, this is just, this is, it sounds obvious, but it's something particularly going off of Emily's question here about what rising seniors should do um, before uh, the fall semester begins is ask early, right? Particularly if you are asking a teacher who has a great impact with their students. Uh, for me, that was my English teacher. My English teacher, shout out to Miss Bryant, um, wrote a lot of letters of recommendation because she had a huge impact on a lot of students. So if you're one of the first students asking, um, hey, Miss Bryant, will you write a letter of recommendation for me? then um, it's not just more likely that that your teacher will write that letter of rec recommendation. It's also more likely, frankly, that they'll spend more time on your letter of recommendation um, and that it, therefore it'll be a better letter of recommendation. If you're asking them in August instead of scrambling and asking them in December, quite frankly, they will spend more time on a better um, letter of recommendation. That's the first piece of advice. The second piece of advice is no matter how close you are with that student, or pardon me, with that teacher, see if you can schedule a one-on-one -on -one sit down session with that teacher. Half hour after school, half hour on a certain lunch break during an off period. Um, because a teacher knows you within the context of the classroom, but in order for that teacher to write a truly impactful essay speaking to your character and how you can fit within a university community, they need to know more about who you are, about your passions, your extracurriculars, what you do outside of class, what you dream of doing in the future. They're not going to just know that from teaching you in biology, right? So second piece of advice after asking early is uh, the teachers that you ask, schedule a one-on-one -on -one sit down session with them. Um, and then the next piece of advice that I have relates to what I would say are three categories of teachers and mentors who you should ask. Um, depending on the university, depending on your own personal approach, um, you might have two letters of recommendation, you might have three. Um, I would say do these three categories. First is obviously um, ask a teacher who knows you well and who likes you. Like I said, for me, that was Miss Bryant, my English teacher, right? Um, she knew me as a good student because I got straight A's, but she also um, knew me because I spoke up a lot in class. I would talk to her a lot after class. I would invite her to the plays and musicals that I was in, right? She knew me as a human being, right? More than just simply a student who submits five paragraph essays and fills out the test, right? Because I was very active in class. Um, I loved the class. Um, and I talked to her about my life outside of the class. So that's first category. Talk to a teacher who knows you and who loves you. Second is ask for a letter of recommendation from a teacher in a weaker subject. For me, 
that was math, right? I'm, I'm not, a, I was not a STEM student. Um, I was a humanities and social science student through and through. So I asked my math teacher. Um, and a big benefit that that had is that that teacher has a perspective to not just write about you in the context of a place where you're excelling, but to write about you in a context where you struggle, where you need help. Um, what was great about um, asking my math teacher uh, is that he was able to write about the fact that, you know, certain principles in calculus did not come naturally to me, but he could talk about how I actively pursued a time with him and actively, you know, was asking questions to get better at a subject that I was not necessarily naturally good at. So he can talk about, he or she or they can talk about you in a context um, where you don't necessarily naturally thrive. Um, and that speaks a lot to your character as a student and as a human being for an admissions officer. So a teacher that loves you in a subject that you're strong in, a teacher in a subject that you're weak in, and my third recommendation would be to ask a mentor figure who is not a teacher. Um, because again, that speaks to you as a human being, which is what uh, admissions officers are looking for more than just you as a student cranking out tests and papers. Um, for me, that was, uh, as I mentioned before, I both uh, was a student at and then later taught at a martial arts studio. So I talked to, I asked the owner of the martial arts studio um, to who was my boss and a mentor to, of mine to write a letter of recommendation. And what she was able to speak to was um, she had seen me grow over the years. She had seen me struggle with things over the years. She had um, seen who I am as an employee, as a teacher, as a student. She saw me outside of the context of the classroom. So if you're able to get someone who, um, a boss at a job, um, a coach on a team that you're on, a mentor in any other capacity at an internship, um, in volunteering at any and at anything in that category, um, that that to me would be the third um, person to ask for letters of recommendation. Um, before moving on to a different category for the back half of uh, this live stream, uh, let me check in with our comments here. A comment from Adela asking, "What's your advice for dealing with rejection? What if I don't get into my top choice school?" This is a stellar question, right? Because um, especially for me as the the video producer here at Crimson, you know, if you if you watch our videos, a lot of it is uh, students who are thriving at a university who are doing really, really cool things at their university who got into their dream university. Um, so a lot of what, A, what we see, you know, kind of portrayed on YouTube channels like this or across social media in general is success, right? You're, you're seeing your friends post like, I got into Yale, I got into USC, People tend not to post as much. Um, wow, I didn't get into my dream school early action and that hurt, right? Um, so what I would say first is that, um, let's talk about this YouTube channel in particular, right? We we film uh, day in the life videos with students all around the world at, at awesome universities. A lot of the students, and you can see this through our day in the life videos, um, especially kind of the final part of the videos where they talk about reflecting upon their position when they were a younger student, when they were a high school student applying to universities, is that um, a lot of these students uh, did not get into their first choice. A lot of these students get in, didn't get into their first, second, third, fourth, or fifth choice, right? Um, but here's the thing, they're still thriving. They're still loving college. They're still loving their university. Um, 19 times out of 20, uh, a student will probably love the university they go to more than their high school experience, right? College is great. A lot of colleges are great. You don't need to get into Harvard, Yale, or Princeton. You, there are so many incredible universities. So if you were rejected from a top university, I, that stinks. No dancing around that. You know, that's, that's a hit. That hurts. Um, but it's not the end all be all right? You will, you will get into another university. Use that rejection to reassure yourself that, you know, it's not, it's not a reflection on your character. It's not a reflection on who you are as a person. It's just, you weren't necessarily the right fit for that university. There will be another university where you are a right fit. Um, so I would say in terms of dealing with that rejection, A, you know, let yourself feel hurt for a little bit. Let yourself feel the pain of getting rejected. Um, process it, and then use it to, to fuel what happens next. If you get rejected, early action, um, early decision, use that to fuel the rest of your applications. If you um, come regular decision time, you didn't get into your top choices, um, you know, the schools that you do get into, 
realize that that's a school that wants you. That's a school that wants you to be at their university. And the thing about all of these universities is they are communities where you can thrive, um, be it academically, extracurricularly, and beyond. Um, so let, you know, let yourself deal with the rejection, but then also let it fuel you um, to whatever your next endeavor may be, be it more applications or be it the school that maybe wasn't your first, second, or third choice, but is a school that you're going to go to and absolutely thrive at. So that's my advice in terms of dealing with rejection. Now, um, as we're at the 40 minute mark, I'm gonna shift away a little bit from applications, from the Common App, from admissions, um, and deal with, uh, we actually got quite a few questions about um, college life itself after the admissions process and um, about how we at Crimson on this channel um, film. Um, so one of the questions that we got was just simply, how do your video shoots work? That's a great question. Um, we filmed at, uh, 50 universities all around the world. We will typically go, um, to a region where there's a number of universities, right? If we're going to the Boston, Cambridge area, there's Harvard, MIT, Tufts, BU, BC, and beyond. If we're going to the Los Angeles area, there's USC and UCLA, the Bay area, Stanford, UC Berkeley, and so much more. We'll film at multiple universities over the course of a few days. Um, and ahead of time, our, you know, one of our core series is a day in the life where you, our viewers can see what's it like in the shoes of a student at this university. Um, so leading up to that shoot, we'll reach out to a number of students. Quite frankly, the first thing that we do is we reach out to students who worked with Crimson Education, right? I run the YouTube channel, I produce the videos here, but Crimson at its core um, works with students all around the world to get into their dream universities. And um, it's spectacularly successful at that, right? Uh, Crimson students this year got into universities in record numbers. They got into every single Ivy League, all of the top 50s, um, and and so much more. You know, the, depending on the university, Crimson students are anywhere from four times to seven times more likely to get into a certain university compared with students that didn't work with Crimson, right? So there's tons of Crimson students all around the world. That's the first thing that we'll turn to. I'll reach out to many of the brilliant strategists at Crimson Education when, say, I'm going to your U Chicago and Northwestern, I'll say like, hey, did any of you work with students who are currently at U Chicago and Northwestern? That's who we'll turn to first. We'll reach out to those students. We'll schedule uh, several hours to film with them, track them throughout their day, learn about what a day in their life is like, what advice they have for other students who want to apply to that university and so much more. Um, Beyond that though, we uh, we do get a lot of submissions and this is a, a great opportunity for me to say, hey, you can submit if you got into the college of your dreams or into any other college. Um, every, every single week uh, we get students who say like, hey, I watched your day in the life videos. I would love to be featured in them. My favorite story actually related to this. Um, there was a student by the name of Anthony who emailed us at a uh, video at crimsoneducation.org. You can also in, uh, email info at crimsoneducation.org and talk about video. We'll get passed on to us. Um, Anthony was a student who emailed us while he was applying to universities. And he said, I've watched so many of your videos. Um, and A, they taught me a lot about admissions. B, they inspired me to apply to schools that I thought were out of my reach. One of those schools, his dream school was UCLA. Um, and he uh, reached out to us saying like, hey, I wasn't going to apply to UCLA. I thought it was out of reach for me, but watching a lot of your day in the life videos at UCLA, I could see myself there. So you know what? I applied. Um, and then what was beautiful to see about a year later, uh, after he got into UCLA, he said, hey, because of your vid your videos inspired me to apply to this university. And I never thought I would get in. I got in. Um, thanks. And furthermore, I'll be at that university in the fall. Would you want to film a day in the life with me there? Um, and that's exactly what we did. You know, we managed to build a filming trip such that uh, we could film at UCLA, USC, other Los Angeles area schools. And we filmed with Anthony. And by the time we filmed with him as, as a freshman, he was really thriving. He was on the pre-med track. Uh, he was interested in neuroscience. Um, and we were able to essentially film the type of video with him as the uh, a featured subject that he had watched um, when he was applying to university. So that was a really special experience for us. Um, and then going back to the original question, how do the shoots work? Um, the third category of students that we'll sometimes, um, that we'll sometimes work with uh, are sometimes we will peruse through um, university uh, student run newspapers, right? Uh, when we went to U Chicago a number of years ago, we had found a student who was doing some incredibly 
cool photojournalism work on the south side of Chicago. When we went to um, Johns Hopkins, we found a student who was featured um, because she had been involved in a dance documentary, right? So we will find students in other ways who are doing really cool things at universities um, as well. Uh, I'll take a chance here now that we've gotten a few more questions in the chat from, it looks like Jamie and Raphael. Uh, first one, Jamie asking, how nervous were you as class day speaker? Uh, great question, Jamie. Um, I was indeed when I uh, graduated from Harvard in 2015, realize how precisely that ages me. You can do the math if you'd like. Um, I was the class day speaker, it was very cool. At Harvard, um, there were four different uh, speeches given on class day, which was the day before commencement. Um, five speeches actually, if you include um, our uh, special celebrity guest speaker was Natalie Portman, who was incredibly nice and wonderful. Um, the four categories, right, there were um, uh, uh, two speeches that were given that were on the more inspirational side, two speeches that were given on the humorous side. I uh, submitted four over several rounds of applications um, and tests uh, to, to write and uh, present one of the uh, humorous class day speeches. I got it. Um, I tell you what, I was I was pretty nervous because uh, <laughs> there were uh, you know thousands of students and families. Um, out in front of me, uh, Natalie Portman was to my left. Uh, all of the different deans and presidents of the college were to the sides of me, um, including ones where I had, you know, written some jokes about them that the class marshals told me that I had to cut. Um, so I was pretty nervous. Uh, but ultimately, you know, like public speaking was one of my favorite things. Performance is one of my favorite things. Writing is one of my favorite things. Um, so I just sort of let myself uh, enjoy it once I finally got on that uh, on that stage. Um, that speech is somewhere up on YouTube. You can check it out. Um, I wrote about the Harvard Student Handbook and how it guided us through our four years at the university, but also how it won't really be able to guide us in the future. Um, my mom was very proud of me at the end because I did, in fact, um, eat paper in front of um, thousands of Harvard graduates um, and uh, <laughs> professors um, using a metaphor with the Harvard Student Handbook. Check out the speech. You'll see uh, exactly what happened there. Um, next question that we have in the feed before I return to the list of questions that we got from Instagram DMs is what are some common mistakes that students make on their college applications? This is a great question. So earlier earlier in this live stream, I talked about um, you know certain things to like avoid in the Common App Personal essay, for example, right? And that you don't want to use the Common App Personal essay to talk about your resume and CV items to talk about your achievements. Why do you not want to do that? Because we see that in another part of your application. We see that within the Common App Activities list. And that's not what the Common App Personal Essay is for. The Common App Personal Essay is to talk about you and your character, you as the protagonist of a story, how you changed and evolved through a certain experience to become who you are today, how it shapes your POV and how you view the world and who you want to be and what you want to achieve in the future, right? That's what the personal essay is for. So I would say a core thing um, to answer Raphael's question here is um, I think a common mistake that is often made in college applications is trying to do everything in each part of the of the application, right? A lot of pieces of the application. You've got your Common App personal essay, you've got your supplemental essays, you've got your activities list, you've got your letters of recommendation. Um, in addition to that, uh, the admissions officers are receiving your GPA, um, your test scores, all of the sort of raw data about your um, success and achievements as a student. A big mistake that we see is trying to pack all of that into one part of the essay, right? A big red flag is students trying to talk about their accomplishments and all the cool things that they've done, all the awesome scores that they've gotten in the personal essay or in a supplemental essay. You don't need to do that. Remember that your S you remember that your application, pardon me, is holistic. It contains so many different pieces because application officers want to see not just who you are as a student, but who you are as a leader, who you are as a human being, who you are outside of the classroom, what your character is. So I think a big a, a big mistake we see is students essentially trying to do too much in a certain area. Um, another mistake that we see um, is, I guess we could call it a lack of thematic consistency. Um, while it is true that you don't want to try to do everything in one part of your application, you don't need to do everything in your personal uh, statement, you don't need to see everything about yourself and your pursuits in your supplemental essays, um, 
what does need to be true is there needs to be a thematic through line throughout. And that's something that um, uh, Crimson Education strategists are absolute pros at, is helping you build that full theme, that full story. Um, so a mistake that we get is, is sometimes in going, is the pendulum swinging too far in the other direction and having a personal essay that sounds like it was written by a different person than the supplemental essay was written for. So it's a lot of nuance and massaging in terms of figuring out along the way, what sort of nuggets from this side of my life are informing my approach to things in this side of my life, right? If I'm involved in community service, but I'm also involved um, working in a lab because I'm interested in the hard sciences, how are these connected? And a big thing that we do at Crimson is we do the active connection between those when it comes to certain things like your extracurricular pursuits. I mentioned earlier, the capstone project is something that strategists and extracurricular mentors at Crimson Education really, really encourage and help build with our students is um, something bigger than yourself, something, um, something outside of the category of say a drama club or a soccer team um, that combines multiple interests that you have together in a way that demonstrates exceptional impact, in a way that can be written about in a local newspaper, on a blog, um, on your own social media accounts, that kind of thing. Um, something that has its own external impact that you help to build that connects what might be seemingly disparate parts of your personality, of your achievements, of the way that you spend your days, your months. Um, so that's some initial thoughts, right, on common mistakes that students make on their college applications. I will use this yet again as an opportunity to say that uh, this is from my perspective, right, as a uh, video producer who's filmed with hundreds of students, right, and has seen sort of what goes into a successful application. But I'm by no means the experts. The experts are the strategists and the academic advisors at, at Crimson Education. So um, if you want help avoiding those pitfalls, avoiding those common mistakes, creating an application that is thematically consistent, that talks about who you are and how you've grown and why you will be an exceptional member of a certain university community, click the link below in the description to talk for free with one of our academic advisors who will talk about exactly that, who will talk about who you are as a person, who you are as an applicant, how to maximize the great things about all of that and maximize the possibility of you getting into the university of your dreams. And if working with Crimson Strategists, extracurricular mentors, tutors, and beyond is the right fit for you. Um, oh my goodness, we are approaching the hour mark. So I'm actually going to go back to the list of submitted questions that we got. Um, well, oh, one of the, um, I'll do two of these questions at once. We got one question that was, what was your favorite college to film at? And what are your favorite videos that you've made? I'll answer the first one first. What um what are my what have been my favorite colleges to film at? I would say I'm biased in this regard, but my first favorite college to film at was Harvard because that is where I went. Um, I was able to you know revisit uh, a lot of my favorite locations on campus. I was able to really uh, sort of look at the campus that I spent four years at um, through a completely different lens. First of all, through a literal camera lens, um, but also to really really put myself in the shoes of and tell the stories about students who at that same university did wild, wildly different things than I did while I was there. So Harvard comes first. I think another university that was really exciting for me to film at um, was Cornell. Um, a big reason for that, I mentioned earlier in this live stream that oftentimes we try to, you know, group campuses together, right? We'll go to Boston, we'll film at Harvard, MIT, Tufts, BU, and BC. We go to Los Angeles, we'll film at USC and UCLA, U Chicago, and Northwestern in the same trip. Um, Cornell in Ithaca, New York is uh, pretty far away from a whole lot of, uh, else. So we were singularly focused on Cornell for four days straight. We filmed with a really cool um, wide range of students, an architecture student, an animal science student, a student interested in hospitality. We also happened to be there during maybe the four days of uh, incredible sunlight and warmth, uh, which can be rare in Ithaca. Um, so, so many students were out and about, really excited to talk about their experiences. We were also there um, right before their big spring concert. Um, it was just a cool, very, very different experience than I had before in a, in a, um, at a university that really was in a very much a college town far away from, from a lot else. Um, the second question I wanted to address here was the, uh, what are your favorite videos that you've made? That's a very, very tough one. Um, I think, um, some of my favorite, Ooh, this is a tough one. 
I think it's been very cool to film with students who have a really, really wide range of interests. A good example was we filmed a day in the life with a student by the name of Cheryl at Dartmouth. And she was a chemistry major. She was also a power lifter and she was also a flautist. So we got to cover a whole lot of ground, um, you know, from a videography and video production perspective, a lot of different cool visuals and, um, and audio in terms of traveling through her life from the lab to the gym, lifting um, hundreds of pounds to, uh, to a concert, right? Where she beautifully performed on the flute. Um, we've had a lot of students like that who have a wide range of interests. Um, and then I'd, I'd say the other favorite videos to film is that we've had a great opportunity to film with students over the course of their college career. A few students come to mind who we filmed when they were freshmen, then we filmed it with, them, with them when they were junior, then we filmed with them when they were a senior, right? We had a student uh, named Ryan, who was actually a Crimson Education student from Singapore. We filmed when he was a freshman, who, when he was like, ah, I just got here. I think I want to do computer science. We filmed with him later. He had changed his major. He had um, started reaching out to and being involved in a lot more clubs that he never thought he would be involved in. And then by senior year, he knew where he was going to go after then, and he'd really grown as a person. That was a cool through line to see. Another student, a uh, student by the name of Sayoon, who we filmed at Princeton, we filmed him um, when he was a freshman, and he was like, I definitely, definitely want to do pure math. And in addition to that, um, he played the drums and uh, he played squash. The next time that we filmed with him, he was like, pure math is not for me. I have switched over to applied math. I've switched a lot of the ways that I uh, spend my time. Um, and then by the time we filmed with him when he was a senior, he knew what he was doing um, beyond. And he had a lot of really um, remarkable sage advice to give to a lot of younger students. Um, and uh, one of our most recent students who we filmed at uh, USC, Nico, we filmed with him when he was a freshman and then when he was a senior. Unlike the other two students, he stuck with the same major, um, but with a with different intent behind it, right? Um, he was involved in a certain, uh, a very long title to a, uh, a very specialized um, political science related major at USC. Um, very, very cool major. Uh, check out the videos. Uh, he kept that major throughout, but at the beginning, he was really, really interested in um, going into politics. By the end, he had uh, figured out a specific area of the nonprofit world and community service that really interested him the most. And he took advantage of USC's resources related to certain um, archives and whatnot um, to really funnel his own research and uh, career paths towards, um, towards community service and beyond. Um, uh, but let me actually, in our final minutes here, go to these last couple um, questions that we got in the feed. I got to tell you, I've got about 20 more questions that we got submitted, but the good news is that we are going to keep live streaming on Fridays. So stay tuned to our next live stream. And if you submitted a question on Instagram via a DM or a comment, we will get to it, if not today. But I'll use my final minutes to um, talk to uh, these last couple questions. One question, if I'm rejected from one of the Ivy Leagues in early decision, can I apply to the university in regular decision again? My answer to this would be, I am not an expert in this field. There are many people at Crimson who are. I do know there's an option if you are waitlisted from an Ivy League to essentially, um, and Crimson experts can help you on this, to essentially sort of write a letter of sorts to the university essentially saying, hey, I know I was initially waitlisted here. Um, here is here are some of the updates basically in my life. Here are you know some of the things that I wrote about in the fall um, regarding some of my you know the nonprofit that I founded or the lab that I work in. Here are some material impacts, material changes that have happened in the last few months and how I've grown since when you read my application essays a few months ago. So I know that there is. Um, a route through which you can essentially write a letter being like, hey, I know I, I was waitlisted. Here's what I've been up to the most recently. Would you essentially reconsider or, or consider taking me off of the wait list? I would say, uh, again, I'm not an expert in that. So if you have um, a specific question, sign up for a consult below truly um, in, in the description and talk to our academic advisors about it. Um, next question being, do my, does my acceptance into a test optional university lower if I don't do standardized tests? Um, that's a fantastic question. I think test optional, um, has become more and more popular, especially in light of, you know, a lot of sort of access issues that became prevalent and apparent um, during the COVID-19 um, pandemic. And I think that, um, I believe that the official sort of crimson recommendation is that albeit tests optional, um, still take the test, but take the test that um, suits your learning style um, and your test taking style the most. There are some, there have been, there are some major uh, differences between the SATs and the ACTs and some people's, um, you know, brains are more wired to one or the other. Um, I think officially, 
um, your ability to get into a school is not, your likelihood is not lowered if you do not take a test for test optional. Um, they are uh, genuine, I believe would be the word uh, about test optional. Um, two final questions I'll take here. Uh, what about extracurriculars activities? Can you give advice, please? I would love to earlier in this live stream, uh, talked a lot about extracurricular activities. Um, uh, so the recording of this live stream will be up and available at this very link later this afternoon. So I would encourage you to watch through that. Um, we also have a lot of different, uh, videos on the channel specifically about both what extracurricular activities to pursue and how to write about them come college application time. Um, and the final question here, is it okay if my extracurricular show varied activities, uh, would it look like I'm scattered everywhere? Would I be considered not passionate enough? Again, I would encourage you to watch this live stream from the beginning. Uh, the full video will be up. I talk a lot about this in particular. Um, if you have a lot of extra activities and you're genuinely passionate about all those activities, A, and B, if there's a way that you can tie those activities together, be it thematically in terms of how you write about them in your application or in the form of a larger project like a capstone project is what we call it a crimson education that can combine disparate interests passions and pursuits then yeah have scattered interests have scattered activities um it doesn't reflect poorly upon you uh it can reflect poorly upon you if you're just doing a lot of activities for the sake of doing them but if you're doing it because you're passionate about them because there's a core reason for you to do them then go for it and with that, we've just surpassed the one hour mark. It really flew by. Um, again, I'm Sam Clark with Crimson Education. I'm the lead video producer here. Um, a lot of what I was saying here was essentially from my experience traveling to 50 different universities all over the world, interviewing 400 students, talking to them about their experience in applications, their experience at their dream university. Um, but actually, I'm, I'm not really the expert, all right? At Crimson Education, I make the videos. The true experts are the strategists and the academic advisors who get students into universities in record numbers, as I said earlier in the stream, up to four to seven times more likely to get into your dream university if you work with Crimson Education as opposed to not. So um, take this opportunity. In the description below, you'll have to extend it. Um, there is a link that directs you to a form you need to fill out um, to sign up for a free consultation with one of Crimson's academic advisors. It's free. They'll spend a, a, a good amount of time talking to you about your profile, about schools you want to go to, about um, actionable things that you can do right now to maximize your chances of getting into the school of your dreams and ways that you can work with Crimson Education through different iterations of the teams that we assemble around each student um, to really, really, truly maximize your possibility of getting in. So I would say subscribe to the YouTube channel, uh, click the bell icon next to subscribe so that you get a notification every time we're posting a new video and certainly every time we're doing another live like this. Uh, we've got live streams coming up that will feature me, but we'll also feature a milieu of other Crimson experts, renowned professors, student influencers, so much more. We've got a lot of really, really exciting stuff coming up on the live stream. But beyond that, if you really want to take the next step to getting into the school of your dreams, click that link below, sign up for a consult with one of Crimson's academic advisors. This was a lot of fun. I look forward to the next one and we will see you next time.